Hello, and welcome to our webcast on the year of elections 2024. We hope this will be the start of a series of webcasts exploring politics, geopolitics, the global economy, and how those issues impact on you, our clients. I will preface the remarks on the year of elections by saying we're recording this at lunchtime on Tuesday, the 12th of March, 2024. And they say a week is a long time in politics. It'll be a very long time this year. So events may have changed by the time you get to watch this. I want to welcome my guest today is Pat Leahy, political editor of the Irish Times. Uh, Pat is the author of The Price of Power, Inside Ireland's Crisis Coalition and Showtime, the inside story of Fianna Fáil in power. He's also written and presented political documentaries for RTE, including Enda. He's a native of Clonmel, holds a law degree from UCD and is a former Reuters fellow in Oxford. Welcome, Pat. So to kick us off, just to put some context, we wanted to talk about 2024, which is widely being dubbed as the year of elections. Almost half of the world's population will get to cast a vote uh, this year. Eight of the 10 most populous countries on the planet will have elections this year. Some of them have already had elections. And of course, critical to all of us, Ireland, the UK, the European Union, the US will all cast votes that are, uh, will all have an impact on what happens in 2025 and beyond that. And of course, all of those elections take place against a backdrop of a continuing erosion and decline of democracies around the world, increased polarisation of views, of extremes on right and left, of income polarity, increased uncertainty general, and a need for urgent action on climate and sustainability. Pat, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I, I want to start on the US election. So here we are on the 12th of March. We've had Super Tuesday. We're down to two candidates, two octogenarians slugging it out, both of whom have been president before. Is it a bit of a damp squib at this stage? I think it'll be anything but a damp squib once we get to it. I think that the lineup of, uh, you know, the, um, the, the repeat of Biden Trump is probably not what lots of people would have uh, would have wanted, but the vicissitudes of American politics have given us uh, that contest. And unless something happens yeah. to either man, and that is not beyond the bounds of possibility, it yeah. is one of them. I mean, I think a theme we'll come back to again and again uh, over the course of our discussion is volatility yeah. and unpredictability. And that's one of the things that we've got to factor in, you know. But um, I guess there's, you know, that's a that's a, that's a known unknown. Um and, uh, you know, looking forward to the American presidential election. OK, so we've got to talk about uh, about Trump and Biden. You look at the most recent polls and they're indicating that, uh, you know, Biden could be in trouble. A number of the swing states yep. that Trump has a small but consistent lead in. I would urge caution on looking at those polls right now because we know that once the campaign starts, mm. an awful lot of voters, I mean, you talked about the, the year of elections and yeah. it's a great year for political nerds, <laughs> for sure. But we know that not everyone is no. a, a political nerd. In fact, the political nerd community, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty safe to say, Small. is in a minority. <laughs> and so an awful lot of voters yep. uh, everywhere, but in this instance, we're talking about the US, won't begin to zero in the last on weeks. the choice that faces them until the campaign proper begins. So, I mean, traditionally, they would say, come back to me and talk to me after Labour Day. So those polls, now look, every politician says, you know, they want to be ahead in the polls yep. all the time. But I think that for the Biden camp, I wouldn't start to get very seriously worried at this stage. They clearly have, you know, considerable headwinds that are going to be something that they have to contend with. But as regards the polls, Let's look at the campaign polls once, once the, we get a uh, bit closer. What, what, yeah, exactly. Once once polling day hoves into sight, you get into September, October. That's when you really need to, need to start taking attention. Fully agree with that. And I think that's the appropriate time to look at it. But but some of the hard data we do have, if we look at the primaries where Republicans had a choice, thirty to forty percent of them said, "I don't want Trump. I want somebody else." Um, is that a banana skin for Trump? Like I, I think about the silent minority who tripped up Hillary Clinton by maybe telling their friends and family, "I'm going to vote Hillary," and then not. Do, are we going to have the same effect with MAGA voters? I mean, look, you know, Trump owns the Republican Party. Yeah, now. that's that. That's for sure, and the primaries have demonstrated that. 
but it doesn't own it all. Yeah. And within the Republican Party, and therefore by extension amongst those swing voters, yeah. you know, whose votes are up for grabs, and increasingly we see around the world, and I guess we might talk about this about when we come to talk about Irish politics later, the, the de-aligning of traditionally uh, allied voters that has occurred over the last 10, 15 years or so is particularly acute in the state. So all those swing voters in the middle, many of whom won't talk, will make up their mind until late. The very significant negatives for Trump amongst those people. We know there are the never Trumpers amongst the Republican voters. Are they going to come out and vote for Biden? I think a lot of that depends on the campaign. Does Biden look like a viable president over the course of the campaign, even for people, you know, that are not traditional Democrat voters, didn't vote for him the last time. But we know that lots of voters swung towards the Democrats in the uh, in the midterms. Abortion was a big uh, issue there. That hasn't got away for particularly for uh, for a lot of women. So while, you know, Trump has a nose ahead in the polls, there's going to be these sort of very significant obstacles, I think, that he has to overcome. A lot of that maybe depends on Biden's performance over the course of the campaign. Can he stand up to the campaign? We just don't know that now. Yeah. You know, the Sleepy Joe narrative, you know, was so pervasive, but he gave a barnstorming performance last week at the uh, at the State of the Union report. So I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of it is in Biden's court. How does he campaign? Can he convince those swing voters in the middle? Can he persuade Phil Hogan, an Irish politician and uh, former Euro European commissioner once campaigned in Ireland to uh, to asking the voters of Fianna Fáil, his great rivals, yeah. could they lend their votes <laughs> to his party, Fianna Gael? And maybe that's a pathway for Biden to ask anti-Trump Republican voters to lend Biden their votes in uh, in November. And Pat, I get that, but when I when I look at it, and admittedly we're very far out from the general election in the US yet, right? But Trump has that problem that there's a rump of never Trumpers even in his own party, right? But if I look at the Biden side, you, you've got the problem of age, which keeps coming up and the Sleepy Joe issue. You've got a, a, an organized movement now in swing states of Arab Americans who are coming out and saying, we're really not happy with your policy on Israel and, and on Gaza. You, you've got issues around the fact that despite the the empirical evidence the economy is doing well, he doesn't seem to be getting any credit for that in the polls. He has a pretty disastrous popularity rating for a US president coming into an election. What, can he get over all of those negatives against him and beat a pretty impressive electoral machine? Yeah, look, that's the... You know, that's a big question, which in a way is kind of, I mean, you're right to identify those issues, but it's kind of unanswerable at this stage yeah. because so much of that, I think, depends on how Biden campaigns, you know. Yeah. I mean, you talk to some people in the American political system, you know, on the Democratic side, and they're terrified of, you know, a trip going down a flame steps. Yeah. I mean, if I'm running Hopefully. Biden's campaign, I'm getting practicing, <laughs> I'm getting him practicing <laughs> on the stairs steps. every day, you yeah. know. And, you know, one trip, down the steps yeah. at the wrong point in the campaign and, you know, it's game over. You know, now you could say the same for Trump, you know, and the, you know, the characterization of Trump as hale and hearty and Biden yeah. as old as female, I, I don't think that's perfectly accurate either, either physically or, or, or mentally, uh, to be honest. But I think an awful lot of that, I think if, if Biden campaigns well, yeah. and you talk about absolutely correctly, I suppose, with that, you know, the, the issue of the war on, uh, on, on, in, in Gaza and the effect that, that, is happening, that, that that's having on democratic grassroots uh, organizations, not just Arab Americans, but, uh, but others as well. But we don't know what that looks like in six months time, no. you know, and you no. see the moves that the U.S. is making. And, uh, you know, what's the situation on, uh, on the ground in Gaza six months time? It's kind of impossible Completely. To, to say. I mean, you're correct that it will be an issue. We just don't know how that issue is going we're, to We're play. far too so far out. Again, with the economy uh, and often six months down the line, you know, how is the healthy economy impacting we know it's traditionally a lag time but is has that lag time been overcome and is it impacting on americans wallets at that stage that will be the test it's kind of unknowable at this stage completely and and i'm not going to ask you this because i think it's no but surely vice presidents particularly vice president candidates particularly on the democrat side would be a big difference you've, you've got to imagine people are going to vote the ticket this time out will they though you know uh, i mean i i think it was the hope of everybody in the democratic camp that Kamala Harris was going to be a more 
visible interventionist, substantial vice president than she has turned out to be. Yeah. Is putting her out and running kind of like a joint ticket, is that really going to win more yeah. votes for But you think uh, it'll be Biden? Kamala again? I do, yeah. It's a very big... Really? Very big issue to dump yeah. her at this stage. And it would be... I mean, if he dumps her, if they've got to pave the way before the convention, that means it's the story of the summer... I'd be surprised. Actuaries would give this vice president a high, a, a reasonable probability of making it into the White House, into the Oval Office at some stage over the next five years for either candidate, I suspect. Yeah, and uh, but you've got to think that if the Democrats were minded yeah. to replace Harris, they would have done so by now. I think it was visible two years ago, maybe three years ago, that she wasn't going to be the sort of vice president that some people had perhaps hoped and if they haven't gotten rid of her by now you've got to think that the chances of doing it simply because of the political effects of it and the extent to which it would dominate the narrative over the summer are are i'd be surprised i mean who knows but i'd be surprised okay F- final question on the u.s we've had previous u.s presidential campaigns where an independent has tripped things up right and and i just wonder with these with RFK Jr. still plugging away, could an independent be what messes things up here? I mean, yeah. You know, you've seen them, as you correctly say, in uh, in the past, having a decisive impact on uh, on elections. And, you know, no independent is going to come next or near the White House. But you don't have to come next or near the White House to have a decisive impact on, um, on, on, on the presidential outcome. And you look at how tight... The presidential election was the last time, the time before that as well. It yeah. really is a 50-50 yeah. nation. And a couple of thousand votes yep. in a couple of states. Yep. I mean, you know, you can see something kind of similar in, in Ireland in some respects. So it's still much less of a binary system than it is in, in the states. So a, a, a third party candidate or an independent candidate doesn't have to make a big impact electorally in terms of the number of votes that he or she gets. They don't even shoot in all states. Massive impact. Absolutely, yeah, just sure. have to hit that. Okay, so let's let's move from two very polarizing, very extreme octogenarian candidates, and let's go to the UK, where we've got two broadly centrist, broadly sensible, broadly lacking in charisma candidates. But Starmer has a twenty-point poll lead at the moment, right? And now we don't know when the election will be, right? But what does that look like? What ha- what does he have to do to trip up and fall over as he heads to? It's, it's Cheltenham week as we record this. So as he heads for the jump, what does he have to? Uh, what does he have to do? I, I mean, he is the ultimate safety first candidate now, <laughs> isn't he? Um, the next election, you go back to when you know Boris Johnson was elected with that big, you know, red wall, uh, red Labour's red wall crumbling. Absolutely, that whole realignment of the politi- the British political system. But by the time Johnson comes to be gotten rid of, yep. or uh, are, 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 are pushed out. I think at that stage, both because you have this narrative of chaos with the, the Tories, the breaking of trust with regard to the, the parties in Downing Street during lockdown, that's sort yeah. of breaking of, of trust. Plus also on the other side, the departure of Jeremy Corbyn and the, uh, the advent to the leadership of Starmer, who's a you know, you know, very much a centrist on the right of the Labour Party, um, which is the only place from which the Labour Party has ever, ever. won elections. Yep. You know, there's a very obvious lesson there for those <laughs> of us looking in from the outside. So I think even at that stage, it is always likely that Labour win the next election. I think that becomes completely inevitable with the disastrous premiership of Liz Truss. Yeah. And I think at that stage, the... Uh, the the outcome of the next election becomes practically written in stone, assuming that Starmer doesn't trip up. And I think that Starmer correctly, at that stage, judges. I think he makes that judgment. Yes. That he doesn't have to do anything, just not screw it up. And I think that he has been, that has been his watchword day and night since that. I think he will make no far-reaching promises, his policy programme will be conservative. He will ape what Blair did before 
the uh, before the ninety seven election in not trying not scaring off the middle ground voters. Now Blair had a you know a program that was certainly reforming. I mean, it wasn't radical, but it was a very reforming platform. I think Starmer will be kind of similar to Blair. Yes. I saw Peter Mandelson popping up, you know, on panels and platforms <laughs> with uh, with Starmer recently as much an indication of anything that we're in for, you know, Blair 2.0. Of course, that drives loads of people in the British Labour Party nuts oh, yeah. to talk about Blair, you know, but he was the most successful both electorally and politically absolutely uh, ever had and you know people talk about his legacy in Iraq but he won a general election yeah. after Iraq yeah. so um, so I think that's very much a playbook that, that Starm is having and I think that they're you know to the extent that anything is ever certain in politics it seems to me that a Starmer led Labour majority government is very very likely in that election whenever it comes and, and can I go back to something you said there about the impact of Liz Truss, right? So as Liz was leaving Downing Street and the lettuce was wilting away, was there nothing Sunak could do at that point? Like, even looking in hindsight, do we think there was no way he could win it back for the Conservative Party? I think what Sunak, I think the job that Sunak has yeah. for the Conservative Party is to make the defeat manageable. Yes, yeah. To not give up it's a 150-seat majority that it takes two elections. Yeah. When Blair thrashed the Tories in 1997, it took them three elections to get yeah. back. That's the nightmare scenario for the Conservative Party. So I think that Sunak, you know, were he to be totally honest with us, yeah. would admit that his, uh, his real task for the Tories the gap. is managing the defeat not turning around what it seems to me is already a foregone conclusion. And and can I ask you, because um, you wrote a piece recently on the timing, right? So obviously Sunak hasn't called an election. It doesn't need to call one until next year. Um, we don't have any indication of when there'll be an election called. In our, the only we're certain is the US election will be the first Tuesday in November. Give me your sense of when these three big elections might happen for us. Yeah, well, we so, so as, you're, as you say, we know when the US election is the first Tuesday in November. The British election has to be called before uh, December of next year, next year. so it can yep. push into January of 2025. The Irish election must happen. The, 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 the final date, I've worked this out recently, the final date that it could possibly be is the 22nd of March of 2025. Essentially, the choice that Leo Varadkar, the Taoiseach, has is, I mean, he's got three windows. He can go in this spring before yeah. the local and European elections. I think that's really unlikely, made even more unlikely by the defeat in the referendum uh, here last weekend. So I think his two realistic windows are the autumn of this year and the spring then of, uh, of next year. The general consensus... And or never mind a general consensus. Okay, you know we've worked it out. We think the most likely, uh, within the most likely uh, window for him is in the uh, the autumn of this year that he would do a budget, perhaps an early budget, uh, mid to late September, possibly early October, pass through a finance bill as soon as they can in the doll and go to the country. Then either end of October, start of November end uh, mi mi middle of uh, of November. Of course, the British election could come at any stage. Probably nobody wants an election in that real no. depths of winter tends not to be great for turnout uh, or canvassing for turnout. So so the nightmare scenario for some of us is that you have an Irish general election, a British general election and an American presidential election all within a couple of weeks of one another, which very much would not be uh, what would be ordained by the Irish Times if we were to be <laughs> put in charge of organising that timetable. But I don't think that anyone's paying too much attention. But a wonderful, exciting period for political nerds. Oh, look, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be great fun, you know. But, um, but certainly, no matter what happens, we're going to have those three elections within the next 12 months. Before I move to the Irish election, just one more question on the, the UK, right? Because, so, so let's assume Starmer is the next PM, right? Um, there's a lot of work to do there. The economy is still stuttering. NHS is under pressure. The US have called out the... I'm thinking of the big icons that were the greats of Britain. And they are struggling with 
defense forces, with NHS, with the economy, with export. Like, there's a big job for the next prime minister. Massive. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be amazed if before, at some stage before the next election, Labour starts putting out the narrative, you know, that, uh, you know, this country's in such a mess, it's going to take us two terms uh, to, to, to fix it. Um, and so much depends on the performance of the economy. But a new administration, a more competent administration, the sort of certainty that a government with a large majority at the start of its term can give to, you know, business and to the wider economy. I think that is helpful. There's also, there will be a sense of, I mean, you you, you and I are both probably old enough to remember back to the early days of Blair. And I think that's the comparison that people yep. will go back to consistently exactly. over the next 12 months. Things can only get better. Yeah. Cool Britannia, the sense of a country that was, you know, changing, was putting a period uh, a difficult period of economic stagnation. The irony, of course, that Major bequeathed an economy that was in recovery yep. to uh, to the Tories, but or to to Labour got no yep. got no credit for no. it. But uh, but that you know that the country is rejuvenating itself. I think that's a very powerful narrative for an incoming government. It's that's the sort of momentum that they will try and generate. Uh, and and so okay, so let let me go to Ireland, right? And before we talk about a general election in Ireland, I want to talk about the referendum, right? Because turnout wasn't bad for a referendum at forty four percent, but an overwhelming defeat. And and what does that I know as we record this, there's lots going on and lots of recriminations, but just think forward to a general election. Let's assume it's post the summer. Will that be forgotten or are there lessons to be learned here? OK, so there's one narrative about that, that because the government proposed these constitutional changes and was they were overwhelmingly rejected by voters uh, at, uh, at the weekend, that the government is therefore so unpopular that it's going to lose uh, the next election. Actually, if you look back to the history of referendums, you know, they don't necessarily yeah. presage electoral defeat. The most electorally successful politician in recent Irish history was Bertie O'Hearn. He won three general elections uh, in, you know, uh, uh, what was it, six weeks, two months before his 2002 re-election, yeah. he lost uh, a, a referendum on, uh, on, on, on well, constitutional sure. provisions on, on, uh, on abortion. So those sort of things happen. They don't necessarily mean electoral, uh, uh, electoral doom for the incumbent government, just as Winning a referendum yeah. doesn't mean impending electoral triumph for, for the election. We know the same-sex marriage referendum went through the year before Fine Gael and Labour suffered very heavy losses running yeah. as an incumbent government in 2016. Same thing with the abortion referendum for the Fine Gael-led minority government in, in, 20, uh, in 2018. They got major reverses at the subsequent general election in 2020. Uh, but... I think the correct lesson actually to learn out of this is that the result of the election suggests that certainly people are not prepared to take on trust what the government says. It also suggests that there's very considerable political failings within the government, both in preparing for this referendum, agreeing the wording, rushing the actual ballot, short-circuiting the parliamentary uh, uh, progress of the referendum bill and then fighting the campaign, which was anemic, insipid, low energy and, un and unconvincing. And if those problems of political capacity and political judgment aren't addressed, then they are on track for a very difficult election. It's not so much the result of the election itself, if you get my meaning. Totally. It's the things that led to that result. And if they can be addressed, as some governments in the past have shown they can be, then uh, I, I think it doesn't necessarily have a direct electoral effect. So, so capacity and judgment, absolutely. Can I, can I throw two others into the mix just to test you on? One is, I think, a poor groundwork and ill-discipline, uh, Lisa Chambers as an example, right? Yeah. But also, I think we're all going into the next election with a broad view, you've got the outgoing government and you've the opposition, right? And actually the fragmentation post the referendum with the Greens blaming their party colleagues or government colleagues uh, for, for poor showing from them. Does that ill-discipline and that kind of fracturing of the government side, does that harbinger anything for the future? I think you make a good point about, about discipline, which is it 
is essential in uh, in election Absolutely. campaigns and not just in the month or three weeks of the campaign, but for that entire period beforehand. Because while they have these kind of, you know, they have the program for government, which was agreed back in 2020, they got a whole series of mechanisms for the implementation of that um, of that program for government. And that part of it has actually worked reasonably efficiently. Whatever your judgment on the policies are, they've implemented the policies that they said they would do, perhaps not at the pace that they, yeah. in many cases, that they said they would, but there is a process that the uh, that the, the the mechanics of government, if you like, goes through on a constant basis. What hasn't been worked out is how the government ends, and more particularly, before the government ends, how they manage the process of preparing for an election while they are government colleagues but soon to be electoral rivals. Yes. And that is going to be one of the difficult things. It's not undoable, but it is a challenge, and I'm not sure there is a great clarity within government about how to manage that process, which has the potential to be fractious, as you say, and therefore, you know, runs the risk of the government not collapsing in a no. welter of acrimony. I don't see that happening, but that it just looks like it is running out of road, that it lacks a message, that it lacks a discipline. People go back into their silos and they fight with one another over over votes in an election. That is a risk. Some parts of that are unavoidable because Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael will be electoral rivals. They're fishing in the same pool of votes. Many of their candidates will be. And, you know, that's one of the kind of structural things that is changing and has changed in, uh, in, in Irish politics. And there isn't really a roadmap for it. You know, elections used to be quite simple in Ireland. They're a lot more complicated now. So, so Pat, given that, so, so let's take that thesis that the government parties for what it will, will, will fracture because they'll all be competing in the same constituencies and looking for the same votes. And that will lead to government infighting and some ill discipline on the ground. And they'd be going up against an opposition party that is remarkably disciplined, ran a superb ground campaign in the last election, didn't run enough candidates, but but run a superb ground campaign. How does that play out then? I mean, I think it's a mistake to think of the opposition as, you know, as one unitary force. Yeah. OK. And so clearly Sinn Féin are the dominant party of opposition and the most important trend in the polls since the last election has been the rise of Sinn Féin. They were the most popular party by a, mar- a small margin at, excuse me, at the last election, meaning 24.5%. Typically, they've been polling for much of the period since yeah. then into the mid-30s. Now, there's been a really interesting correction in that lately, the last number of months, where kind of from the maybe the third final quarter of last year, confirmed by a rash of polls, the first quarter of this year, we've seen the Sinn Féin vote come back uh, quite significantly into the high 20s. They're still the most popular party in Ireland. They're still on course to be the largest party in Parliament, in the Dáil, after the next election. Just not by the margins that they might have anticipated last year. And part of what is happening with that recent trend in Sinn Féin support is that their their support is being kind of chewed up a little bit at the edges by other opposition parties. So we talked earlier about Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael fishing in the same pool uh, for many of their votes, their candidates will be. The same applies on the other side for anti-government votes. And the opposition is even more fractured than it was at the last election. So looking for those anti-government Sinn Féin votes are not just Sinn Féin, but the Social Democrats, the Labour Party, loads of independents, people before profit, and uh, and also many green voters or green-inclined voters who have, when you look at their profiles, have more in common with voters, say, of the Social Democrats and the Labour Party, Sinn Féin in some respects, than they do with the you know, centrist or center, uh, center-right parties. So it's a really complex picture with all these sort of internal dynamics working their way out, which is one of the things, of course, that makes the whole thing so bloody difficult <laughs> to predict what's going to happen. 
OK, so we're definitely not going to call the US or the Irish election and we think Starmer it's his to lose, right? Can I just, I, I, a quick comment on the EU elections in June, but in particular in the constant, because you've touched on it a couple of times over the last half an hour, the increasing rise of the anti-vote, anti-the establishment, anti-the government, anti-everybody else, that, that polarisation out to the far right and the far left. Just, and, and maybe a comment on the EU elections and maybe you can sweep that into it. Yeah, I think it's a really good point, right, about it's, it's I mean, it's, it, it has different iterations in different elections, but there is kind of, you know, a common theme uh, amongst, uh, you know, if you look at elections and also in national elections right across Europe, we've seen it in, in uh, Portugal, in, in Holland, we've seen it in, uh, in Portugal, where is this rise of anti-establishment um, uh, anti-establishment votes, both on the right, yep. uh, you know, the extreme right, and on the uh, and on the extreme left, so kind of a push against the centrists, the governing the governing centrists. And part of that's part of Trump's appeal. Yes. you know, the whole drain the swamp narrative, yeah. the deep state narrative. Interesting. See, Liz Truss is beginning to talk about the uh, the <laughs> deep the deep state. Uh, as well. I'm blaming the Financial Times for it. But. Uh, well, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Long, uh, uh, long a representative of the deep state. But um, uh, I think you see that sort of theme with its own local effects played out in lots of places. And we will see it at these. Uh, we have local elections here, of course, uh, in, in early June. And on the same day, the European elections take place all over the European Union. And there's a real fear in Brussels yeah. that the governing centre of, you know, the Christian Democrats in uneasy coalition with the, the, so, uh, with, uh, the, the socialists uh, may lose their majority yeah. in the European Parliament. And if there is a major swing to the far right, which yeah. is what is... Uh, I, I, you know what is terrifying an awful lot of establishment p- political figures, not just in Brussels, but in uh, in the various member states, that you could have a European Parliament in which the governing centre no longer has a majority. Now that seems to me to be unlikely, but it is not beyond the bounds of possibility, and that would be an acute crisis for the European Union uh, if if uh, if it happened. Uh, no, and I, I sorry, I'm just reflecting on on all of that because we could end up well, we'll end up with a US president that, and we that we know what they're like, right? But we could end up with a MAGA president. We could end up with a reasonably centrist prime minister in Britain, but but a very difficult domestic challenge for them to face. A very fragmented EU Parliament and the implications that might have for legislation, and very tight and too early to call in Ireland. It's a very uncertain environment that we're heading into. I mean, it really is the kind of cheap characteristic of politics in the modern age is this volatility and unpredictability. And you know, in some respects, you know, our entire conversation has been me kind of weaseling out of making firm predictions. <laughs> I, I, I expected that, nothing but, less. <laughs> but but it's it's because I mean I. I I think I think a lot of it goes down to you know, and without going down a rabbit hole of of you know political developments in the last twenty years, I think a lot of it kind of comes back to great, a great political dealignment in the wake of the financial crash, which destroyed the uh, the confidence of many voters in their traditional political homes, and we've seen that here and more toxically in lots of other places uh, in Europe and, 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 and indeed in the United States. And I think, um, I think that does a couple of things. It underlines the importance of the campaigns, you know, because yes. all those voters, yeah. you know, you, you now remember a, a period when in an Irish election, before the campaign ever started, 80% of the votes were already spoken Box for away. because people voted according to their traditional allegiances. You yep. know that's no longer the case. Absolutely. Loads of those votes now are up for grabs. Are, they're up for grabs in a campaign, and that uh, emphasizes the importance not just of the an effective campaign on the part of the uh, of, uh, of the various parties, but also listening to voters. Voters really don't want to be taken for granted. We saw what happened in the referendums again uh, last weekend. Voters are disinclined to take the word of, you know, their political betters. They will make up their own minds. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a fascinating six months.
Pat, there's so much more we could have talked about. I would have liked to talk about immigration and the rise of nationalisation and nationalism and, and there are lots of stuff that has impacts on many of our clients. But I think when we get close to the election and policies are clearer and polls are clearer, we can come back and revisit that. But thank you very much for your insight. Much appreciated and thank you. It's my pleasure.